Hi, this is John Wellman, Associate Pastor at Calvary Baptist Church. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video message from Calvary today. If videos like this are a blessing to you, would you consider giving financially back to Calvary so that we can continue to make videos like this available, getting the gospel to the ends of the earth by any means necessary? Simply go to calvaryelco.org, click on the giving tab, and any donation of any size would be very much appreciated. Thank you and God bless. Well, good morning. Uh, thanks for gathering with us this morning at Calvary Baptist Church. And uh, as we're scattered, not just here in Elko Spring Creek, but I know that we have people literally from around the United States and even uh, some in South America who watch us. Thanks for, for joining us today. Let's have a, a word of prayer, and then we're going to look into God's Word together. Father, whether we're gathered within a church building or gathered in front of a computer, a smartphone, a television screen. I am so thankful that through your Holy Spirit that you speak to all of us wherever we find ourselves. So this morning, would you speak to us, challenge us, encourage us, make a difference through our lives. In your name we pray. Amen. The coming of Jesus Christ, his death, his resurrection, changed the world. And over the last number of weeks, we've been looking at that theme, that uh, the, the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ changes everything. And I want to look at that again this morning, but I want to look at the final words of Jesus and how those final words have had lasting change in our world today. You know, last words are often amusing. Sometimes they're informative. Uh, some are memorable. Others are not. History has recorded some lost, uh, or excuse me, some last words worth noting. For instance, Sir Isaac Newton, when he died, he humbly said this, I don't know what I may seem to the world, but as to myself, I seem to have been only like a boy playing on the seashore and diverting myself now and then in finding a smoother pebble or a prettier shell than the ordinary, while the great ocean of truth lay all undiscovered before me. Leonardo da Vinci was also overly modest. He said this, I have offended God and mankind because my work did not reach the quality it should have. That, my friends, is humility. You know, while last words are amusing or they're interesting, or maybe they give us something to contemplate, when we come to the last words of Jesus, Jesus' last words revolutionized the world. So I want to spend some time looking at those words and how they have changed everything. So the, the very first point in, in our outline is the final words of Jesus. Let's look at those final words. They were so important that they're recorded in all four Gospels and in the book of Acts. In Matthew's gospel, it's chapter 28, beginning at verse 18, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all these commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And then in Mark's gospel, we read this. And then Jesus told them, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. Luke records those last words in chapter 24, beginning at verse 44. Then Jesus said, when I was with you before, I told you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said, yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. It was also written that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name 
to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem. There is forgiveness of sin for all who repent. You are witnesses of these things. And then in John's gospel, chapter 20, verse 21, again, Jesus said, peace be with you as the father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And then finally, in Acts chapter 1, before Jesus' ascension into heaven, he said this to his disciples, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You see, Jesus' final words were simple instructions to his disciples, to his followers, to tell people everywhere they met about his death on their behalf. Uh, it was to share the message everywhere they went with everyone they met. It, the good news was that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. It was the good news that through Jesus Christ we can be made right with God. That was the final words of Jesus. It was the final directive that he gave to his followers. And that, those, those final words, that final directive, became the commission for his church for the last 20 centuries. And because the early church and the middle, you know, the middle ages church and the church in the 1700s and 1800s and 1900s and, and the 20th century and so forth, because we have been obedient to that commission, our entire planet has been radically changed. Let me, let me talk about the impact of obedience to that commission. Obedience to these final words, let's, let's start with the then, the then. You see, for these early followers of Jesus Christ, obedience to this final directive was very natural. There was no pick or choose what they were to obey or what they weren't going to obey, kind of like we might do today. No, Jesus said, go and make disciples, and that's exactly what they did, beginning very shortly after Christ's ascension into heaven. You look in Acts chapter 1 and, and verse 15, and you see there are 120 believers who are gathered in the upper room there in Jerusalem. Uh, for 40 days after his resurrection, Jesus had been appearing to the disciples frequently, but now he's ascended into heaven. And the 120 believers are gathered and they're praying and they're waiting. For 10 days they pray and they wait. And then comes the festival of Pentecost, that Jewish festival that celebrates the end of the grain harvest. And it was on that day of Pentecost that the Holy Spirit came upon that early church and filled them with power. And the natural result was they began to share the story of Jesus Christ with people everywhere. In fact, in chapter 2 of Acts, we have recorded Peter's sermon, his testimony, his witness to the people concerning Jesus Christ. And it says in Acts 2 and verse 41, those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day about 3,000 in all. The church is beginning to grow. And so the church continued for weeks and for months from that time forward, preaching Jesus Christ. And as a result, many people were being saved. For instance, in Acts chapter 4 and verse 4, we read, many of the people who heard their message believed it. So the number of believers now totaled about 5,000 men, not counting women and children. The church continued to grow, but locally. They were in Jerusalem only. Uh, Jesus, remember, had told them in Acts 1.8 that you'll be my witnesses, yes, in Jerusalem, but also in Judea, in Samaria, and to the far regions of the earth. Uh, some Bible scholars have said that God allowed the persecution that came about once uh, Stephen was killed for preaching about Jesus Christ, that persecution came. And, and some scholars say God allowed that persecution to thrust the church out away from Jerusalem so that uh, his directives might be fulfilled. Well, whether God did that or not, that persecution did result 
in the message of Jesus Christ leaving Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 1 and, and uh, excuse me, chapter 8 and verse 1, it says, A great wave of persecution began that day, sweeping over the church in Jerusalem, and all the believers except the apostles were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. And then in verse 4, But the believers who were scattered preached the good news about Jesus wherever they went. And so then Luke in his uh, re record we call the book of Acts tells the story of Philip, one of those early deacons, who went up to Samaria and he preached about Jesus Christ. And so now the Samaritans have received the good news of Jesus Christ. And then from that point, he went down south of Jerusalem and he met a, a, a government official from Ethiopia. That government official heard the good news of Jesus Christ and was baptized and carried his newfound faith back to Ethiopia. And tradition tells us that Ethiopia became a Christian nation. In fact, from time to time, Ethiopia will claim to be the oldest Christian nation in the world. We see also Peter, and he's carrying the gospel message. He's in Joppa, and he carries it up to Caesarea. And there he goes into the house of a Gentile, a Roman officer, and he shares Jesus Christ with the Roman officer and his family and his friends and people who've gathered there in his house, and they accept Christ as Lord and Savior. And so the gospel continues to spread and the church continues to grow. Another result of that persecution was the conversion of the chief persecutor, that of Saul of Tarsus, or as we know him, Paul the Apostle. And through Paul and his associates, the gospel message was carried to Antioch of Syria. And from Antioch of Syria, the gospel message then made its way with Paul and Barnabas to the Isle of Cyprus, and then from Cyprus up to Asia Minor. All the time, people were being converted, churches were being built, Christianity was growing. After that first missionary journey, Paul again went back, this time with Silas, back through Asia Minor, and then the gospel message took the leap and entered into the European continent. As Paul began to preach in Philippi and Thessalonica and Berea and Athens and, and Corinth. And it was in Thessalonica that we have a statement from the opponents of Christianity that really serve as a barometer to show us the growth of that Christian church. Listen to this in Acts 17, verse 6. And when they, meaning his opponents, could not find them, Paul and, and, and his company, when they couldn't find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers, that's some of the fellow Christians, before the city authorities, shouting, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. You see the reputation that Christianity had? It was turning the world upside down with its growth. Well, following several years of ministry in Europe, in what is now modern-day Greece, Paul then returned, a third missionary journey, back into Asia Minor, and he spent an extended period of time in the city of Ephesus. Here the message was well-received, and uh, during that time, most likely the seven churches of Asia that are mentioned in the book of Revelation were established through the, the ministry of, of Paul. In Acts chapter 19, verse 9 and 10, we read this. So Paul left them, uh, and he's talking about those who had opposed him in the synagogue there in, in Ephesus. And he took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. By the time the book of Acts closes, sometime in 60, 61 AD, um, based on the listings of the towns and cities and regions that are mentioned in, here in Luke's account of the growth of the early church, um, the church had reached 31 towns, cities, or regions. In fact, the testimony of Paul as he's writing to the church in Rome in Romans 15 verse 19 says, 
I have fully presented the good news of Christ from Jerusalem all the way to Illyricum. Illyricum is in the northeast region of Italy. One writer said this about Christianity in A.D. 150. He said Christian groups could be found in perhaps 40 or 50 cities within the Roman Empire. Most of them were quite small, some numbering several dozen people, others as many as several hundred. The total number within the empire was probably a little less than 50,000 Christians. 50,000 Christians within 115, 120 years after Jesus gave those final words to go and to make disciples. Well, by A.D. 180, there is archaeological and historical evidence that there were Christian churches in North Africa, in Spain, and in France. And during that same time period, Christianity most likely reached the British Isles. These <clears throat> numbers of growth in Christianity really reflect just the growth within the Roman Empire. And they don't include the spread of Christianity to the east of, of Judea and Galilee into what was known as the Eastern Church. Uh, and its Christianity spread rapidly into the areas of what we know today as Iraq and Iran and Afghanistan and even down into the uh, uh, subcontinent of India. Unfortunately, with the rise of, of Islam and those Islamic warriors, they drove most of Christianity out of that eastern area, uh, and, uh, and so Christianity lost sway in that part of the world. By the third century, though, let's go back to the Roman Empire. Uh, around AD 250, the Christian population in the Roman Empire amounted to about 2% of the whole population, or slightly uh, more than a, a million Christians. Fifty years later, by AD 300, historians have proposed that the size of Christianity was about six million. Uh, by AD 300, in, the po in the, just the city of Rome, 66% of the population of Rome were Christians, some 298,000 believers. And so it was in, in AD 313 that Emperor Constantine issued what was called the Edict of Milan that legalized Christianity. That is, it was no longer illegal to be a Christian. And by AD 350, Christians were in the majority in the Roman Empire, amounting to something like 30 million believers, people who are at least nominal Christians. And so in AD 381, Emperor Theodosius issued the Edict of Thessalonica that made Christianity the, the official religion of the Roman Empire. During <clears throat> the following years and centuries, Christianity continued its rapid and exponential growth over the centuries, uh, with Europe, for instance, at least in name only, became a Christian continent. And then the, the Spanish and the Portuguese and the French and the English uh, brought Christianity with them as they came to explore and to settle in the new world of the Americas. And so through the, the work of missionaries and, and also the expansion of the, the British Empire and the Spanish Empire, Christianity spread to sub-Sahara uh, sub Africa, into parts of Asia, New Zealand, Australia. Uh, the Spanish introduced Christianity into the Philippines. And uh, remember, you know, some of this was nominal Christianity, but some of it was genuine conversion to Jesus Christ as Savior. And so Christianity has grown exponentially through the centuries as starting from 120 people and expanding. Well, what about today? What about now? You know, if you and I were to um, follow all the pollsters, we would conclude that Christianity probably has reached its zenith, the zenith of its growth, and it's now on the decline. I mean, after all, in poll after poll, the percentage of those in the United States of America who say that they're a Christian has declined for a number of decades. For instance, um, in the last 10 years, 
There's been a 12% decline in people who identify themselves as Christians. And so today, uh, 65% of Americans identify themselves as Christians. But here's the key. <clears throat> this decline in Christianity is not found worldwide. Yes, uh, you know, America is following the pattern of Europe in this rapid decline of people who profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But the rest of the world is embracing Christianity. And for the most part, it is genuine Christianity, a real experience and trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You realize that Christianity is still the largest religion in the world. Uh, the 219 Status of Global Christianity Report shows that there were 2.5 billion Christians in the world as of mid-2019. And that would be a major increase from just 20 years ago in the year 2000 when there was 1.98 billion Christians in the world. And it was, it's more than double the figure in 1970 when there were only 1.2 billion Christians in the world. So Christianity is growing worldwide. In fact, it's growing at a rate that is greater than the birth rate in our world. Population growth, Christianity is growing faster than population. And it's booming in Africa. It's booming in Asia. It's booming in Latin America. And here's another key. <clears throat> the greatest spread of the gospel today is not through missionaries and mission sending organizations. Although, you know, those were the impetus that got it all started. But the greatest spreading of the gospel today is indigenous churches, small churches with native people, native pastors, people sharing with their neighbors, their friends, their family members, one-on-one -on -one telling about the life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Folks, that might be the Achilles heel of Christianity in America. Because somehow over the years, Christians in America have forgotten that they, each of us have personally has a mandate from Jesus Christ to be witnesses. We've kind of allowed this great divide to emerge of a division between clergy and the average ordinary uh, church member. Uh, in that role of sharing Jesus Christ. Somehow, we've come to believe that preachers and full-time ministers are primarily responsible for sharing Jesus Christ with others. And if you're not one of those, then, hey, you're off the hook. Nothing, of course, could be further from the truth. I mean, look at the history of the spread of Christianity. It has always been individual Christians, regardless of their position or their role within the church, it has always been individual Christians who have shared the good news of Jesus Christ with whoever they met. And if we want the decline in Christianity here in the United States to stop, then it means that every single Christian needs to pick up the banner and share Jesus Christ. Don't leave it to the professionals. All of us need to be sharing faith in Jesus Christ. After all, Jesus gave these final words to all of his disciples. You will be my witnesses. The word you there is plural, meaning you all, every one of us, are to be sharing Jesus Christ with our friends, our neighbors, our co-workers. So let's talk thirdly about our obedience to these final words. He says, you will be my witnesses. <clears throat> Those are words that are meant for each one of us. You see, to be a Christian is to be a witness, and uh, a non-witnessing Christian is a contradiction in terms. We started at Calvary Baptist Church in January talking about who's your one. Who is the one person that God has laid on your heart to pray for their salvation and to work for opportunities to share Jesus Christ with them. Your own story of how Jesus has changed your life. His story of what he did through Jesus Christ in this world. Who's your one? Some of us think, well, you know, that was in January, sort of in February. But now this crisis has come and, and uh, this idea of I've got to get out and witness is gone because I'm quarantined or, or whatever. But you know what? God has given to us in this virus thing and all the stay-at-home advice, He has given to us a great opportunity to share Jesus Christ with our one.
with people everywhere. Peter said this in 1 Peter 3, verse 15, And if somebody asks about your Christian hope, always be ready to explain it. These are days when people are looking for hope. Uh, maybe here in the Elko Spring Creek area, we, we don't have that sense of urgency of the danger that's out there like they do in New York or New Orleans or San Francisco, some of those large cities that are so impacted by the COVID-19 virus. But at the same time, there are a lot of people in our area who are terrified by what's going on. They, they watch the news, and it seems like this whole thing is just hopeless. Some people are out of work. They've had to close their businesses down. They, they're no longer drawing a salary or getting their hourly wage because they can't go to work. And so there's, there's anxiousness. There's worry. There's concern there. You and I have hope. Peter says, be ready to explain your hope. Are we ready to do that? Can you explain why you have hope in Jesus Christ? You see, as a Christian, you shouldn't be complaining. Instead, you've got the hope of Jesus Christ, and you need to be sharing that. Are we willing to be obedient to these final words from our Master, Jesus Christ? Will we take advantage of the opportunities that God is giving to us right now to tell people about the hope of Jesus Christ. We can't miss these opportunities. When we miss opportunities, that can produce profound impact or, or effects. Let me tell you a story of, of a missed opportunity that absolutely changed the world. Back in the year 1217, explorer Marco Polo traveled on what was called the Silk Road to visit the uh, Mongolian Empire of Kublai Khan. On that journey, Marco Polo and his men passed through Central Asia. That would have been modern Turkey and Iraq and Iran and Afghanistan and Pakistan and, and probably all the rest of the stands that were a part of the former uh, Soviet Union. This journey would take Marco Polo and his father 24 years to complete. His trip, though, opened up the Silk Road and, and through it uh, the flow of commerce after, you know, caravan after caravan traveled this great trade route, bringing silk and spices and jewels. But here's the missed opportunity. It seems that Marco Polo's father and uncle had been to China before. And upon that, and when they were there, Kublai Khan and his government were so impressed with the teachings of Christian civilization that Kublai Khan asked the Polos to bring hundreds of Christian teachers to introduce his empire to the beliefs of the West. Folks, that request, sadly, was never fulfilled. There were two Catholic friars who were sent, but they turned back very soon, said the journey was too hard. And that open door to evangelize Central and East Asia was soon closed because of the ne neglect of the Christian church. As a result of that, Kublai Khan and his empire embraced the teachings of the Buddhist monks from India and from Burma. And other countries along that Silk Road adopted the religion of the traders from the Arab countries. And Islam gained an immovable foothold in Central Asia how the history of the world might be different if the church had been faithful in walking through that door, open door of opportunity, but they failed. Folks, I don't want us to miss this opportunity that God has given to us to share hope with people who are feeling hopeless. Be obedient to these final words of Jesus Christ. He said, go and tell, go and make disciples, go and be my witnesses. Folks, when you see God moving around you, when people start expressing concern and worry and anxiety, you know that God is at work. And it's your invitation to join, to say, let me tell you about the hope that I have in Jesus Christ. Be obedient to Christ's final words. It will make all the difference in the world. Let's pray. Father, uh, you said, if you love me, 
you will obey my commandments. I don't know of a more important commandment in days like this than the command to share our hope with other people. Help us to be faithful in telling people about Jesus Christ. Help us to take advantage of the opportunities that are here right now. So many people on online, on the computer, talking back and forth on smartphones. And we have a message of hope. Help us to be bold and not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Use us to make a difference in this day and time that Christianity might continue to grow and to explode, not just around the world, but here in the United States, here in Elko and Spring Creek as well. Thank you, Father, that you hear our prayers. Thank you that you answer. In your name we pray. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining me today. I'll see you next week.